I'd say more importantly for us is actually about the EV transition because EVs today, uh, the, the uptake is, is happening, but they are a luxury item. So we've had a lot of talk over the last few days about the economy. Mm -hmm. um, you have a very interesting lens into the economy through the rideshare business and the eats business. Can you give a sense of, starting with the US, what are you seeing actually happening with consumer behavior? So the consumer, from our standpoint, remains quite strong. Now, the lens with which we're observing consumer spending <coughs> Uh, is obviously spend on mobility, spend on delivery of food, groceries, et cetera. And I think that one of the tailwinds that we are experiencing is because of uh, the, the, the switch from spend on retail that was happening when everyone was at home and going crazy and just ordering a bunch of stuff. Uh, back to spend on services as the world is reopening, people are going out again, they're going to see friends, families, etc. I'd argue that's a little more healthy spend, but we can have a debate about that or not. Uh, and as a result of that uh, shift back to services spend, the growth in our business and what we are seeing in terms of consumer spend on a local basis is, is actually quite strong. So we, we will and also our Q4 earnings, but the range of bookings growth that we got it to was 23 to 27%. That's quite robust. Mm -hmm. uh, and that spend is strong, both in mobility and delivery. So it's not in, in one segment uh, or the other. We've been obviously, because of all the prophecies of doom coming up, et cetera, taking a very careful look in terms of our best business. Can we segment it one way or the other? One of the areas that we've been focused on is the effect of inflation Mm -hmm. on the business, and, and, the, and the effect is twofold. One is we're seeing our restaurant partners now pass through increases in their costs, service costs, food costs, etc. So menu inflation is up about 8 or 9%, and that does have an effect on unit volume. Right? The classic economics, uh, classic economics apply, which is unit volume then, then is a bit slower. So for example, unit volume in our Delivery businesses in the single digits, decent but single digits. Mobility business, it's it's double digits. The other factor. And are people ordering like cheaper dishes and less sided dishes? And this not, really. not really. Okay. We're, we were looking for trade down behavior one way or the other, uh, but it's resulting in just average basket sizes being up yep. and unit volume not growing quite as robustly. Again, single digits, which is fine versus. <clears throat> the mobility businesses, which is growing in the very, very solid double digits. The other factor that we're seeing as it relates to inflation is that about 80% of earners who are coming onto the platform, there are about 5 million people earning on Uber on a global basis. 80% of those who are signing up are saying that inflation, cost of living, had something to do with their decision to sign up, uh, pay for their groceries, pay for their expenses, et cetera. So in that way, our being a platform that can take a little bit of a shock right. that uh, real folks are experiencing in terms of inflation, that makes the platform more attractive. And to some extent, that's a service that we are uh, serving in terms of society. And are you seeing, just quickly, are you seeing the same in Europe? Is Does quickly mean... Go faster? No, I don't mean that you were, you were verbose at all. I thought it was a very interesting <laughs> answer. I'm, I'm all, um, I, I don't want to spend too long on the economy. I want to get into the business stuff. Of but course. Just, um, uh, Europe, is that the same picture? Very similar in Europe. Very similar the, picture. the picture in Europe looks quite similar. Business is strong. Uh, same thing in Latin America. So I think the shift from retail to, uh, to services is pretty consistent. Uh, I think your headline or headline that I read was that retail spend, you know, looked pretty weak recently. And again, I wouldn't necessarily take long-term trends out of that because we made the mistake during the pandemic of thinking that the retail boom was, you know, a long-term trend. Turned out that, uh, you know, everything kind of returns to norm. So I do think that later in the second half of the year, the growth should modulate off of a very, very high base right. as services spend returns to normal. 
and then we'll see what happens. But presumably, you don't re given the, the the lack of experience, you don't really know to what extent this is just resilience of your business versus what the economy is doing. Uh, I've seen, uh, you know. Uh, Many, many times CEOs have made predictions based on short-term trends and declare them as long-term trends. Reversion to norm is a very, very powerful, powerful force. Right. Um, so you wrote a memo in May about being hardcore on costs and seeing hiring as a privilege and pushing for profitability. Um, can you talk just very quickly about the impact of that on the business? I mean, how has that sort of galvanized people? Um, and then I've got to follow up. So. Absolutely. We, we were pretty early in making that call, thank God, and in hindsight. Um, I saw things changing. And, and you know, in business, the biggest mistakes that I see executives make is when they don't know what the definition of good is. Mm -hmm. They think they're doing a good job, but they actually, you know, they're aiming for a target, but it's the wrong target. Right. And the reason that I wrote that memo was because I started seeing what we're seeing right now, which is interest rates coming up, capital being pulled out of the market, and performance that was defined as excellent in the past, lots of growth, who cares about profit, is performance that is uh, described as not good enough or middling in our new world. Yep. So I didn't want to, and, and you know, we're a big organization, we organize behind plans, lots of people working their asses off to, to get to those plans. And so the reason why I wrote the memo was, you know, just like any company, we had annual plans in place and quarterly targets, et cetera, and everyone is kind of gunning hard for these targets, and I felt like our definition of good in terms of performance, in terms of what our own plans were, were no longer good enough, and that we had to be much tougher on costs, uh, and we had to achieve the same growth plans with a lot less investment because the world was changing, investor expectations were changing, changing as, as a result, our expectations would change. So honestly, the early reaction, like that wasn't a, a wonderful memo to get from your yeah. CEO on a Sunday night, right? So it kind of landed uh, a bit like a lead balloon mm -hmm. uh, initially, but we as a company, as a culture that really rallies, we talk to our teams, the teams really rallied, and I think our performance since then has been on an operating basis, uh, really leading the pack. And I think as we enter 2023, at least I feel we are well prepared because we've been operating based on the expectations of the real world for a longer time than a lot of other companies that you see are making adjustments now. And a lot of companies to that point are making adjustments and yeah. having to lay people off in significant numbers. Yeah. Um, is your early action meant you are going to avoid that? I mean, how, how do you see that situation? I certainly hope so, right? We're, we're not at this point planning on any uh, company-wide layoffs, et cetera. We, you know, it's a job of the CEO to performance manage people and parts of the company all the time. I'm always going to be taking people out of, you know, if there's a group or a division that's underperforming, take people out. And then if I should reinvest those folks or reinvest assets or marketing monies, that's part of the everyday job right. of, of a CEO. So we will be making those <clears throat> kinds of shifts, but the core business uh, and the core workforce, et cetera, we think are well-balanced and well-positioned for the future. I certainly hope it stays that way, but it is a dynamic environment and, and we're gonna adjust pretty quickly. So very broadly, the end of the cheap money era, you've talked about inflation and rising interest rates, has obviously had this massive impact on tech valuations yes. and tech in general. Yeah. Um, how far do you think we are through that adjustment? I, I think that the 80% of the shock is behind us. And I think a lot of companies you're seeing are making that initial adjustment to get there. Uh, I personally think that the markets generally are betting on a softer Fed than I see, uh, while commodity price inflation, et cetera, is definitely easing up. We have a freight business uh, that's involved in transportation. Transportation costs are coming down pretty significantly. I don't see service inflation uh, as being transitory. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's making its way through the system. There's a there's a delayed effect in terms of inflationary effects through the supply chain then all, all the way up to a consumer. And inflation moves slowly through the system. So we saw it, we were surprised by it because we didn't see it in the end product. And so I think that, the, at least from my standpoint, 
Uh, I think the Fed's gonna stay higher for longer. So for companies that are hoping for a reprieve or companies that are hoping, hey, this will be a year, things will be yeah. better next year, I just have to like make it through this year, I think they're gonna be disappointed. So for those of us who aren't sitting in Silicon Valley, you know, under the surface, how bad is the pain? I and mean, what are you seeing in terms of the, the people you, your suppliers, people you, you do business with? I, first of all, I, I think it's a healthy shift that we're going through, yeah. right? Blue collar worker uh, pay generally has trailed GDP growth, et cetera. So I, I think the shift that we're going through in terms of services, industries, uh, Uber drivers, couriers, et cetera, earnings, uh, moving up at, at strong rates, I think that's a healthy shift for economy. And yes, our economy is going to have to make, a, make, a, make an adjustment, but I think it, it, it'll, it'll be a healthy adjustment one way or the other. <coughs> uh, your competitors had a, a rougher ride, your main competitor. Um, it's fair. Is there, um, is there anyone that you particularly would fear in a consolidation type situation coming into your market as a competitor? I mean, who do you in kind of fear? In terms of ride share? Of coming in and buying Lyft and actually um, doing something with it. Are, are there any of the big tech operators or people that you particularly fear coming in and taking you on? Honestly, Thorold, I, I don't spend too much time thinking about it because it's a waste of time because I'll get it wrong. Fine. Okay. Right? So let's, let's move on from that. So I, I want to do a quick... Uh, quick fire round of questions, and then we'll sure. go on to some other stuff. Um, when do you expect a meaningful number of self-driving cars in your fleet? Uh, define meaningful. Uh, 20%. Oh, wow. Uh, 12 to 15 years. 12 to 15 years. Um, my Please don't remind me 12 to 15 years from now. So. We will. We'll, um, <laughs> but it, keeps, it seems to push out each time someone gets asked that question. But OK. Um, OK, 15 to 20. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> will there be a US recession? Yes. OK. Uh, will NASDAQ be higher or lower at the end of the year? I don't care. <laughs> what is the biggest benefit of having people back in the office? This. The, the reaction, I, I think being back in the office is incredibly important. I think that hybrid is the better way, but we've got to make that human connection. I missed it desperately, so I'm trying to force our team to come back. Uh, and uh, some of them are happy about it, and some of them aren't. Is there a drawback of having people back in the office? Sure, convenience. But you know, some parts of work aren't convenient. That's why it's called work. OK, and in terms of? <laughs> And in terms of um, you get all of the benefit of everyone meeting up at the water cooler and chatting, is there a downside to people spending too much time doing stuff that maybe is not so relevant? Or is that just a positive of being? No, I think it's part of being human, right? It's, okay. it's, uh, I actually think you, you, you hit a nail on the head, which is Zoom life is very transactional, mm -hmm. right? It's everything is by appointment. Mm -hmm. You start at a certain time, you end at a certain time. Uh, you can't have any casual encounters. Like, think about Davos. Like, imagine having Davos over Zoom, right? It would be terrible, yeah. right? And, and so well, they did. this and is, they, yeah. yeah. Well, how was it? <laughs> uh, I okay. Don't, I don't think I should comment here, but we'll chat later. Yeah, I mean, it, it was so, different. So, so it's just different. The, the, the casual encounters and it, things get done faster. It, it, I really don't believe it should be the only way. So I've heard some CEOs are like, five days a week, we're going back. I don't think going back is the right way but I actually think the hybrid of the two, you get the energy in terms of being with your team and then being remote for a week, totally fine. Right. But then you, you need that connection and energy and kind of the, the quick interactions to, to get things done. Um, and just final thing, um, are you still planning a Uber specifically designed car? We are working with various OEMs to design cars for ride share. Okay. We are by far the biggest ride share partner out there, so I think we will be the first partner for whom they design, but I'd expect them, it's in their interest to leverage whatever, whatever platforms that they build across a maximum volume of, of rides. But we're definitely quite interested in, in talking to OEMs about purpose-built vehicles. I'd say more importantly for us is actually about the EV transition. Because EVs today, uh, the, the uptake is, is happening, but they are a luxury item. The most popular, um, uh, the, the most popular car in the, in the Uber fleet is a Prius. 
mm -hmm. right? Affordable, fuel efficient. And so we need more affordable uh, electric vehicles out there. That is the headline conversation that I'm having with OEMs. Purposeful vehicles are great. Okay. Um, you touched on drivers. Is the shortage over? I mean, there's been obviously a lot of talk about the tightness in the labor market over the last few years, which, again, was inflationary. You talked about the wages coming up at the bottom, which is a positive. Um, has that mitigated significantly? Are you still struggling to find drivers, or is that over now? The, the shortage isn't over, but the, the momentum for us is moving in the right direction. We made a pretty fundamental pivot in terms of our company and our efforts to, to be earner first, to be driver first, to really focus on the driver experience in terms of onboarding, uh, improving customer service, driver earnings are excellent, but even giving them visibility, for example, to earnings. Drivers uh, in the US and many other markets didn't know what destination right. the rider was going to. We now give them upfront destinations. So it's not just about pay, it's about the entire driver experience. That's resulted in uh, driver turnover being down 20%. Mm -hmm. Drivers are driving more, so driver engagement is up in the teens. We added uh, about a million drivers, so we're up to actually a million earners, drivers and couriers, so we're up to five million earners now on a global basis. We're the world's largest source of work, not just gig work. And the momentum in terms of our earner base is growing because the experience is getting better. And certainly, the experience on Uber versus our competition is starting to create some space. And inflation in terms of the wages they need to earn, is that still very high? Uh, driver earnings versus uh, driver earnings last year significantly increased. Yeah. I think that the increases this year are going to mitigate somewhat. Right. But I do think drivers are going to earn more this coming year. Okay. On average. And to what extent does that, and again, so this is a, a little pet peeve of mine, but to what extent has that better visibility for drivers hurt the consumer experience in terms of cancellations and um, availability of, of rides? Has is that, is that affected the consumer appearance? No, it, it, should, it has and should improve in cancellations in that in the previous world, drivers who didn't see the destination, but then once they accepted the trip, saw a destination that they didn't like, they would cancel on you. Right. Now what we do is we show them the destination so that they already know when they accept the trip. So the cancellation okay, is too you. much traffic, et cetera. Now, sometimes the result is, and the experience is, the spinner time, which is the amount of time you say, I want to get a driver, and then when we match you up with a driver, that may take a little longer, and that's because the offer may go to you, it may go to me, it may go to a third driver uh, before that driver accepts, but there's but they're accepting with a lot more information. We think that's a win. Um, what would it mean? There's been a lot of talk around whether Uber drivers are employees or should be employees in certain countries. Um, what impact would it have on the business if you had to make everyone an employee? Oh, it would be uh, terrible for the business. It would be terrible for drivers. I, I think the most important thing to understand in terms of drivers is, you know, I, I was in Amsterdam uh, uh, before I came here. 94% of drivers in Amsterdam have said that they don't want to be employees. In the US, it's 80% of drivers don't want to be employees. If you want a job in this economy, almost anywhere you are, you can get a job. So there's a group of people who are self-selecting into earnings opportunities on Uber and or other gig economy companies that want flexible and, and now, increasingly, very strong earnings opportunities. Right In the US, average earnings per utilized hour is 39 bucks an hour. We are matching up the flexibility uh, of those earnings opportunities increasingly now with benefits. Right. Uh, in France, for example, as a result of sectoral bargaining, representation by the drivers, uh, the minimum amount that a driver can make on a short trip is €7.65. Uh, in the UK, they've got uh, vacation pay, pension benefits, et cetera. We're having discussions with states, governments, et cetera, as to what those benefits can be so that you now have an outcome, which is the flexibility to be able to work where you want, when you want, minimum earnings uh, standards So it's quite well. a gray area between employee and contractor. There's a lot of intermediate yeah, I'd say, steps. Yeah, I'd say it's <clears throat> a good, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a hybrid 
Right. That's better than where we came from. And this we is based on what plus drivers want and what makes sense for you. You're kind Very of finding so. the equilibrium. Very okay. much so. The, the, to, to fully answer your question, in markets where we have flipped over to yeah. employment, because we can operate Uber in an employment model, about two-thirds of drivers essentially lose the opportunity to work on the platform. That's a big number. That would be a tragedy when you're talking about five million earners on the platform. Right. Is there ever going to be, I mean, a lot of, the, a lot of companies have this a situation where there's the American dream of you start on the shop floor and you end up as the CEO. Is there ever going to be a situation with Uber drivers where that career progression inside the company is possible? Or is it always going to be drivers and the rest? Yeah, that situation is now. So, is okay. so one is, uh, you should keep in mind that drivers, the longer drivers drive, the more money they make because they understand the system. They understand when should I drive, when should I not drive, where should I go, et cetera. And as they learn the system, they just earn more. It's a, it's a natural learning process. The amount drivers make is directly related to their utilization on the platform, and the utilization on the platform gets better and better as you understand the, the platform. So that's number one. Second for us is drivers, the most loyal drivers, the best drivers, we now provide them uh, free college education right. um, uh, through University of Phoenix. They can get either a degree for themselves or for a family member. Really cool program that I'm a big fan of. We've now built a program where we got these centers of excellence or green light hubs that essentially are customer service centers for riders and drivers. Uh, we hire drivers to then become customer service reps, et cetera, if they do want a full-time job. Uh, so that's a ladder that, that moves up to customer service, et cetera. We then take the best of our green light agents, customer service uh, hub agents, uh, and we have classes now where we teach them how to code. Uh, okay. We have had classes where we teach them how to be salespeople, to go and sell to restaurants for Uber Eats. So we're creating our own paths up okay. where if you want to stay a driver, you can make more and you have certain benefits. Uh, and you have educational benefits either for okay. your family or you can enter the Uber system in a full-time manner if that's something. That's that really interesting. So you're not stuck as a driver. There is a progression. That's really Yeah, that's I, I mean, you've got to build that progression. Yeah, yeah, I, think, yeah. I think companies talk about it. We try to do it. That's great. Um, you've been in Ukraine just before coming yes. here uh, for a couple of days. Um, can you just quickly talk a little bit about... Um, what you're doing on the ground, and, and also what have you learned that you want to sort of put in place as you're planning for other places around the world where disasters happen, where you are basically part of the critical infrastructure of, of the transportation. So can you just give us a quick... Absolutely, absolutely. It, it was great being on the ground with the team. Uh, we, we've been operating Ukraine, Ukraine since 2016. We've got about 25,000 mm -hmm. drivers in, in Ukraine. Uh, and we first started with using our transportation services to get refugees to safety, get them to the border in Poland. Now we're focused on uh, helping doctors get to hospitals, uh, helping teachers get to schools. I met some of those doctors. I met some of those teachers. You know, the transportation that we take for granted here, they can't take for granted when there are rocket attacks, when there are power outages, et cetera. The, the, the um, availability of mass transit is, is quite spotty. We then built a really interesting program with the UN, uh, getting food and also uh, items for winter shelter, uh, blankets, et cetera, where we built a private label version of essentially the Uber fulfillment infrastructure. Um, you don't want to use big trucks, marked vans, et cetera, to get these supplies out to NGOs that then get, to, get them to, uh, to real people in, in need who've been displaced. So we essentially have a private label Uber right. where they can hail an Uber. It's a private vehicle, comes in, picks up the stuff, or a private truck picks up the stuff, gets them to the NGO. They get them out to uh, folks who've been displaced. Again, I got to see one of those NGOs at work. Very tech savvy, very entrepreneurial, incredibly organized. So for me, it was really encouraging to see the work on the ground. We work with the Ministry of Culture to provide transportation to take works of art and get them to uh, places of safety, get them restored so that we can retain these incredibly important pieces uh, of art and culture in Ukraine as well. So for me, seeing it on the ground, and most importantly, supporting the team, letting them know that I'm with them, and, and also making sure that I send the message to 
Uber employees and, and hopefully broader is that we've got to stay with Ukraine. You know, I, I, I went to Bucha uh, where there are these where where these terrible atrocities happen. You know, when you see the pit in which these victims were buried, not buried, I mean thrown into, it, it just it just uh, breaks your heart. Mm. Uh, and I think we're talking about it here, which is great, is that we've got to stand behind Ukraine. No one knows when this war is going to end. Uh, and, and, and we've got to stay behind Ukraine for as long as it takes. Uber certainly intends to do so. And what have you learned in terms of, you know, in other countries when, you know, unexpected things happen, particularly quickly, you know, yeah. in, uh, in terms of plans that can click into place to facilitate some of these the, these movement the 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 really interesting factor in terms of uber and what makes it interesting is that it's so unpredictable right uh every single city in which we operate is different every single circumstance is different so we don't have a playbook yeah the playbook is how can we help right and so with ukraine it literally started with refugees and then it just organically went to places that we can help i'm sitting down with a ton of partner organizations, and it's just how can we get help? How can we do more? Uber's Uber is unique in that we're a technology company. We've got a big scope. We're in over 70 countries, but we're hyper, hyper local. So the playbook is the teams working with government officials and then just being entrepreneurial in general and trying to help in every single city in which we operate. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I got an email yesterday from WEF saying that uh, Nadella, who was here actually earlier in the week, um, was talking about the AI golden age and that it's good for humanity. Uh, do you agree with that? Uh, yes, there will be volatility, but long term it'll be good for humanity. And what does it mean for your business? It we use, you know, it's not the kind of the chat GPT AI, AI etc., but we use machine learning extensively in our business in terms of uh, how we deal with real world situations. If you look at Uber, uh, every the pricing, routing, et cetera, is incredibly dynamic and our system has to, on a real time basis, adjust to everything happening locally. There is no kind of global model, et cetera, but we do have these AI models that essentially are learning behaviors mm -hmm. on a local basis. So if you look at our pricing algos, matching algos, routing algorithms, fraud algorithms, et cetera, all of it is powered by uh, larger learning models that continue to get better and better and better. Okay. So it's a pretty practical use of AI, but it is, um, it's, it's in everything that we do. Okay, and when you answered the, ori the original question, you, you, you had to think a little bit. Um, it happens sometimes. Yeah, but what I, um, I it wasn't a criticism. <laughs> it was, um, you know, what are the downsides? I mean, you obviously, you know, there's obviously a balance in there. I mean, uh, what do you see as the risk? You know technology. Yeah, I, I think the downsides are that, well, I guess short-term downsides or pain could be that there will be displacement, right? So if you think about chat GPT, uh, you can imagine uh, restaurant menu descriptions, restaurant descriptions being written uh, by AI, the copy in terms of email and communications that we send to our customers being written by AI and being um, personalized on a one-to-one -one basis. The, the use cases are pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Right now when we send an email uh, to you thanking you for uh, being an Uber customer, you know, it's a standard email. Yep. It will be an email to you okay. that will be personalized, et cetera. That standard email is written by a person. Right. Right. So. The, the applications are going to uh, initially put some people out of jobs. Yep. But what happens in our economy always on a long-term basis, then those people find other use cases or else you may go from a copywriter to a chat GPT uh, user who is responsible for the nature and the, the feel of these uh, emails that ultimately are written by ChatGPT, et cetera. So that adjustment period can be difficult, can be scary, et cetera, but I think the end state's gonna be a good one. Right. Uh, we have time for, oh, wow, okay. <coughs> In the front. <laughs> Questions was my, my last word, which I didn't get to, but go for it. Um. Thank you, Darrell. Um, Dara, you came into Uber in a fairly tumultuous public cultural uh, situation. 
my curiosity to you is, as you looked at the culture of Uber, what were the behaviors that you wanted to retain? What were the ones that you wanted to change? And I'm particularly interested in your executive team and, and how you leverage that executive team to change the culture of Uber. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, the, the culture that I want to retain at Uber at the time was this is incredible entrepreneurial energy, innovative, you know, go get them culture uh, that was always thinking about what's the newest, best way of operating. It's incredible rally culture. It's like, let's go. We're not going to wait for a second, et cetera. That, that culture, we've kept the majority of that culture, and that culture is like second to none. I love it. It is so much fun because people really rally at the company. Um, that, that culture was used to be the ultimate disruptor, right, in terms of disrupting the transportation system, et cetera. At some point, the disruptor became an incumbent. And where the company failed was to understand the responsibilities that come with incumbency. And if you're acting like a disruptor, but you're really an incumbent, you kind of look like a jerk, right? And, and you're not taking your responsibility seriously, et cetera. I don't think it's because there's anyone who was bad there, but things were moving so quickly that there wasn't the time to kind of reflect and say, well, what are our responsibilities? So the changes that I made in terms of management actually were uh, on the executive team that was more responsible for some of these factors. I brought in a new CFO, uh, Nelson Che. I brought in a new general counsel, new head of HR, et cetera. And then at the same time, the operating leads of the company who were kind of doing the real work in terms of operations, you know, the head of mobility oper operations, delivery operations, uh, our head of uh, comms and, and marketing, Jill Hazelblaker, who's here, like these were stars who were there, uh, who were at Uber before me, and hopefully will be at Uber after me. Uh, so I think what I'm trying to achieve with Uber is a combination of the newest and the old, which is keep that entrepreneurial energy and edge uh, and the ability to move incredibly fast, but recognize the enormous responsibility that we have and the dialogue that you know, can slow us down, which we're an impatient group, but is very, very necessary to make sure that ultimately when we act, we're acting with the right intent and the output is that we're doing the right thing as a company. There's another, I'll go there, there, and then there. Thank you. So Uber has committed to be net zero by 2040. Can you get there earlier? Uh, we can in certain places, right? So we have committed to be net zero by 2030 in the US, Canada, and Europe. Uh, in London, for example, the target is 2025. Uh, and, and we are making progress. For example, California now, uh, we're at about 10% kilometer miles being EVs, which is pretty awesome. Lots of Teslas in California. Uh, in Europe, it's about 8% kilometer while, uh, miles and about five times the, the percentage of generally what you see kilometer miles in Europe. And I think that shifting the Uber driver over to drive an EV is so much more impactful than the average driver because the Uber driver is driving five to six to seven times you know, the number of miles than the average drivers. So this is a very, very targeted group of people that we should switch over to EV as soon as possible. The biggest blocker I talked about are affordable EVs and also charging infrastructure uh, within cities. Most cities are putting uh, charging infrastructure in the sit center of cities. Uh, that's where wealthy people tend to live but they're not putting uh, EV infrastructure where many of our drivers live and many of our drivers need it, which is in some of the outskirts and other neighboring areas of the city. We are working with cities to give them the data to provide them with, hey, here are the different areas where you should be putting charging infrastructure. And we're working both with private and public to help uh, shape the plans in terms of charging infrastructure. It's going in the right direction, but it's, but it's going to take a lot of effort from a lot of people to get there. Um, sure. Gentlemen here. Um, yes, I'm Philippe Monnier. I represent a Swiss technology provider specialized in 
automotive uh, named Wei Ray. You said before that you are talking to OEM in order to have customized uh, a car, uh, especially for your um, ride-sharing services. If it is not secret, can you share to which OEM you are talking, on which specific um, characteristic uh, those cars will have? I will give the very unsatisfactory act the uh, answer of, it is secret. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the, characteristics? Uh, the characteristics for, um, uh, for ride sharing, one is the passenger area. Uh, sometimes passengers facing each other. I do think that top speeds, for example, top speeds that my, many cars have are not necessary for city driving that's associated with ride share. We're also talking about purpose-built uh, vehicles for delivery, right? You can imagine smaller vehicles, two-wheelers, three-wheelers that have trunk space that that can get through traffic easier and have a much smaller footprint, both in terms of environmental but also traffic footprint than, let's say, a car to go and deliver groceries. So Those are the various areas <coughs> we're looking at. So you're likely to be more of a black cab facing each other model, is that? It? That's certainly a model that we're looking at. But it, part of it is just... What are the capabilities, right? Yeah. You don't, you're not going to have in many cities quite as much highway driving than sure. you do in the U.S., et cetera. That can reduce the specs, and if you reduce the specs, you can reduce the ultimate cost. Final question, and I know we don't, we don't go over the gentleman here. Um, as it would take some time for to have more electric cars, would you consider to have an option allow the customer who can knock their electric car, and then just like, would you like to tip, or would you like to offset your carbon footprint after they take the journey? So I think. Uh, uh, in understanding your question, we have the option for riders now to take Uber Green and to specifically request electric cars. And what we've seen from customers is that customers generally don't want to pay a premium in terms of dollars for an electric car, but they are willing to pay a premium in terms of time. So if the average uh, time to get a ride is four minutes in the market, five minutes in the market, there's a segment of customers who will wait 10 minutes to get, uh, to get an, an electric car. Um, customers tip better for electric cars. It just kind of works that way, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, we are looking at offsets, but honestly, we're, we're spending more time just changing over the fleet, right? So offsets is certainly a char characteristic we'll look at, but I think just spending the energy on changing over the fleet is the highest impact activity of the day. Brilliant. Dara, thank you so much for your time. I know you've got to get to another meeting, so thank you. Thank you very much.